And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, The Clay Tree. Russ Thompson's movements were quiet, his steps slow and even as he paced back and forth across the wide corridor. Outside, the approaching storm was creeping closer. Russ would stop occasionally, look up to where the winding heavy rail staircase disappeared to the floor above. It was almost as if he could see what was going on up there, in old Elvira Clay's bedroom. The doctor checking Elvira's fading pulse. Jennifer Clay, Alvira's niece, looking on. You start to pace again, Russ. And then stop as Alvira's attorney, Jace Devlin, sighs softly from his position in the big wing chair across the living room. What do you think, Chase? You think the doctor's right that Alvira won't last? She's old, Russ, very old, quite tired. Oh. I wish Jennifer would come down and let us know. You heard the doctor's last report. Your attitude, Russ. What about it? Most admirable. I know you've always thought a lot of the Clays. I mean, far beyond your management of their land and holdings. Well, I've tried to do what's right. You've done nobly. Even this feeling about poor old Elvira. After all, it isn't as if she didn't live a good long life. That isn't everything. It helped. Killing of her son didn't help any. Especially the way he was killed. Poor Alvira. I still wish you had tried to talk her out of leaving that tree up there on the hill with that plaque on it to the memory of hasty hands that took justice and law unto themselves. It's a monument of shame. That's what it is. Why shouldn't it be? Your only son was hanged by a wild mob. It was done by mistake, Russ. Terrible mistake. That doesn't bring the boy back. No, no, no. The Anderson girl. They thought he killed. But what are you going to do? Alvira's son was going with the girl. They quarreled. When she was murdered, it was natural for people to think he did it. Natural. It wasn't natural to hang him, take the law into their own hands. But they did, Russ. And then learned too late that the boy couldn't possibly have done it, that it was someone else who killed her. Anyway, I don't condemn Elvira. I mean, for putting a plaque on that tree up there. It's going to stay there, you know. So it seems, Russ, there was that crowd up on the hill. They're pretty mad. Elvira's mind is made up. I wish she'd change her mind. And I hope she doesn't. It's a strange situation, isn't it, Russ? Attorney Jace Devlin mistaking your attitude for strong devotion to Elvira Clay. Actually, it's far different, isn't it? Yes. And as you walk to the window and look up toward the big tree on the hill, you're trembling inside, trembling with fear and anxiety. A little crowd of townspeople around the tree, Russ. Supposing they got excited, decided to tear the tree down. The old clay tree. You hate it as much as any of them, don't you? But for a much different reason. And in spite of your hate, you realize the tree must not be touched, at least for a while. Jace. Yes, sir. I'm, uh, I'm going out for a walk. In this weather? That's right. Going up to have a, another look at the tree? What if I am? Well, I 
Let the people know how you feel, anyway. It will be a long time before they're in the mood to harm anyone else. Elvira's at least accomplished that. Yes, she's at least accomplished that. Fighting the wind as you stride up the hill toward the old tree, your mind spins, doesn't it, Russ? Its branches silhouetted against the sky look weird, accusing. Equally accusing are the softly muttering people standing around at the base of the tree, staring at the plaque which Elvira ordered placed there following the hanging death of her son. You're thankful that the plaque is all that these people can see, aren't you, Russ? Yes. As you reach the summit and the small group of muttering townspeople, you see Hank talking to a news photographer. Hard to blame the old woman for putting up that plaque. Now, let's see now. I want to get a picture of it. Well, it's right there, right in front of you, plain to see. Through the memory of hasty hands that took justice and the law unto themselves. You didn't have to come all the way down here, mister. Those words been in the papers a lot the past two weeks. Oh, no, ours is a different angle. Pictures. We do a layout covering the whole story. The tree here, the plaque, reaction shots of the townspeople. Well, they won't oh. like it. Am I right, Mr. Thompson? What? I, I say folks won't like this magazine fella taking pictures. They're ashamed, but they're pretty fed folks, up. Folks, would you move aside a little, please? I want to get a close shot of that plaque. Oh, I don't Now, that does it. Now, get another for protection. And if you folks don't mind, maybe a few of you looking up at the tree. Suppose we do mind. Yes, we've we just about mind. suffered enough. No, no, no. Easy, folks. Uh, Mr. Thompson, you better talk to him. I'm not interested. Look, folks, I'm just doing my job. It's news. My magazine, they sent me down here. And we're sending you back. Come on. We're not posing. And you have your picture of the plaque. You better do what he says, mister. I can't be responsible. Come on. Well, I... Okay, okay. Take it easy. You don't have to shove. I'm going. I- I'll see you later, Mr. Thompson. I better help him get out of sure, here. Sure, sure. Go ahead, Hank. You wait until a small crowd of townspeople and the protesting magazine photographer have all gone. Then you look around, decide there's no one watching, then step quickly over to the tree, reach your arm down inside the hollow trunk where your secret is hidden. Secret evidence, Russ. Murder evidence against you. Evidence proving you committed the murder for which Alvira's son was hung. The letters that the Anderson girl had written you. The gun you killed her with. Yes, Russ. Murder evidence. Evidence that could hang you. Evidence you hurriedly disposed of the night you killed her. But now, as you try to reach them, you find that the hollow extends much Just... deeper than you thought. Ah. Oh. Oh, it's no use. Probably hollow, clear down to the base of the tree. Mr. Thompson? Uh, you whirl, drawing your arm quickly out of the tree trunk, your hand empty, as Hank, the caretaker, comes back up the hill. Well, he's gone, Mr. Thompson, that reporter. <laughs> they run him off. Just as well. Been somebody around here ever since it happened. Yeah. Hey, what do you think will happen to the tree now, Mr. Thompson? Happen? Why should anything happen to it? Why, well, haven't you heard? I thought you handled all the clay property. Well, my office does, of course, but I don't know what Well, you... I heard only yesterday that some fella named Carson's aiming to buy this property. Wants to put up a new house right smack on the nose here. Oh, no, no. No, Elvira would never stand for that. It, but if she dies, Mr. Thompson, and it seems as if she will, then what? Well, then there's her niece, Jennifer, a good, sensible girl. Yeah, but Jen never did hanker too much after putting that plaque up there. Thought it was unfair to all the people in town that didn't have nothing to do with the hanging. Jan might just sell, don't you think, Mr. Thompson? Well, I, I've, I, I don't know, I'm sure. If you don't mind, Hank, I've got to get back inside. I, I, I forgot I left Jace Devlin waiting for me. You scarcely know what you're saying, do you, Russ? The fear inside you is mounting so. You were so certain you could reach the gun in those letters. Didn't realize that the hollow in the tree went so far down. And that you'll have to improvise a way to fish them out when you get the chance. You hurry back to the house. Discover Jace Devlin on his feet, looking toward the wide, circular staircase. Jennifer is standing there, isn't she, Russ? White face, silent. Looking down on both of you. Then... 
Steve dead. Aunt Elvira's dead. It's up to me now to look after the house of clay. <laughs> In that popular new song, she lived on the morning side of a mountain. He lived on the twilight side of a hill. They tell of a boy and girl who lived so near to each other, yet never got acquainted, never got to know each other. Well, don't laugh, friends. You may be living even closer than that to wonderfully improve performance for your car, yet never get to know what proud performance your car can deliver unless you get acquainted with signal ethyl gasoline. You may never know how quickly your car can start on cold mornings unless you try Signal Ethel. You may never know what peppy pickup, what smooth, quiet power your engine can deliver unless you try Signal Ethel gasoline. For the premium grade of Signal's famous go-farther gasoline is a true super fuel, scientifically engineered to bring out the best in any car of any age. And, fortunately, unlike the boy in the song, you won't have to drive over a hill to try Signal Ethel. You'll need only drive into the nearest Signal station and say, fill her up with Ethel. Why don't you, the very next time you need gas? It was a dread moment, wasn't it, Russ? Hearing that old Elvira Clay was dead and having no idea what her niece Jennifer will do now that it's up to her to run things. You try several times to recover your gun and the telltale letters from the murdered Anderson girl from the old clay tree, but you can't get to them. If the tree is chopped down before you get them, the evidence against you would be conclusive, wouldn't it, Russ? And the townspeople in their fury would destroy you in the same way they destroyed Alvira's son. You know that tree must stand, don't you, Russ? At least until you can somehow fish the gun and letters out of the hollow trunk. You wish that people would stop paying visits to the tree. And then one morning at your real estate office, another visit occurs. A frightening one. In the person of a Mr. Carson. Good morning, uh, Mr. Thompson. That's right. Uh, my name is Carson, Finley Carson. I, uh... Understand you handle the clay properties? I do. There's one particular piece I'm interested in. The knoll just above their place. You know the one, I'm sure, with the old tree. That piece of property, Mr. Carson, is not for sale. Oh? But I thought since the old lady's passed on... The old lady, as you call her, Avira Clay, as I call her, would not have wanted to sell. And I'm certain her niece will respect those wishes. Oh, I see. I hope you do, sir. It'll make it easier for both of us if we... Respect the wishes of the deceased. Well, I must say that's a noble attitude. I didn't think that the average salesman... No need for there to be any unpleasantness between us, Mr. Carson. Perhaps I can show you something else? Uh, not today, thank you. You see, I... Well, I more or less had my heart set on that knoll. Well, Mr. Thompson, I'll see you again, perhaps. Any other property in town, Mr. Carson, I'd be happy to help you in any way. Thank you. Good day, Mr. Thompson. You're safe for the time being, aren't you, Russ? But that isn't good enough, is it? You've got to find a way to protect the secret the clay tree holds. Make certain it will never be taken down. At least until you can somehow find an opportunity to remove the gun and letters from the hollow trunk. You think about it in the days that follow. And finally, the answer comes to you one morning as you're having a late breakfast at the corner lunchroom where you've grabbed quick snacks for years. You listen to the idle chatter of Frank, the counterman. Well, Mr. Thompson, I guess the clay house will have a lot of callers from now on, huh? 
What do you mean, Frank? I mean Miss Jennifer. Now that she's come into the clay money, I guess some of the young fellas around town will be dropping in to see her. Oh, yes, I suppose so. Nice girl, Miss Jennifer. Not what you'd call a raven beauty, but a mighty nice girl. She's all right. Uh, you know, uh, it might be smart for you to think about her a little more, Mr. Thompson, if you know what I mean. I'm afraid I don't. Well, she's always been sort of fond of you, ain't she? We've been friends for a long time. I got an idea she'd like it better if you two were more than just friends. Really? Yep. That's what I think. What do you think? I think I'll have some more coffee, Frank. Pressure would ease, wouldn't it, Russ? If you could be certain that, at least for the present, Jennifer won't sell the clay tree property. She's always liked you, you know that. But you've never paid much attention to her, have you? Hardly noticed her. But Frank, the counterman, gives you an idea. You decide to call on Jennifer, and you do several evenings in a row. And in the weeks that pass, you're most attentive. She's pleased, isn't she, Russ? Until one night as you stop by the house to pick her up. Hello, Jen. Well, not ready yet. I thought we were going out to dinner. Come in, Russ. I'll only be a moment. Sure. I've had a visitor. Oh? Anyone I know? Competition, perhaps? Hardly. My caller was Mr. Carson. Carson? Yes. He told me he's made you an offer for the clay tree property. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And you turned it down? Well, yes, I did. Why wasn't I consulted about this? Well, I, I, I didn't think it was necessary. Didn't you? Well, now, look, Jennifer. Oh, I know. You just naturally assume that because Aunt Elvira and the tree, that I'd turn down Carson, too. Of course. Well, you're wrong. What? I've accepted Mr. Carson's offer. You, you've accepted? Yes. A very generous offer, I think. Yeah, but, but the tree, he'll have it taken down. It's high time someone did. Oh, you can't mean that. I most certainly do. I never dared tell Aunt Alvira, but that tree, that horrible plaque, the whole idea of it. Well, I think it's perfectly hideous. Now, Jennifer, listen it's to no me. It's no use. I've made up my mind. I know Aunt Alvira thought very highly of you, Russ. Listen to your advice. I intend to do the same in all matters except this. I insist the clay tree property be sold. I see. Mr. Carson will be expecting your call in the morning. I want you to handle all the details. Of course. Now, let's drop the matter, shall we? It seems hopeless, doesn't it, Russ? You're certain you can't talk Jennifer into changing her mind. Carson's won. He'll have the tree chopped down immediately. And unless you can recover the damning evidence against you first, its fall will reveal your guilt. You spend a sleepless night trying to think of a quick way out. Following day, you're in your office when a visitor calls. It's Jay Stevelin, Elvira Clay's attorney. Glad I found you in, Russ. Why, something wrong, Jace? I've just heard some rather disturbing news. Oh? The talk around town is that George Carson is going to buy the clay tree property. Well, yes, that's right. I tried to talk Jennifer out of she it, but she can't was... sell, you know. She... What? According to the terms of Elvira Clay's will, Jennifer cannot sell that property. She can't sell? That's right. It was Elvira's way of making certain nothing would happen to that tree. Jace. Jace Stadlin, are you sure? Of course I am. Drew up the will myself. <laughs> I'm surprised Jennifer didn't know about it. <laughs> she, she, she can't sell. Something amusing, <laughs> Russ? <laughs> Certain I can't sell, Russ. According to Jay Stavlin, and he ought to know, he drew up the will for your aunt. Oh, I see. I gather you didn't bother to read the will, Jen. Oh, no, I didn't see any reason why I should. I, I knew Aunt Elvira had left everything to me, and... Well, that, I suppose. No sale. No sale. If you'll excuse me now, I'd better look up Carson and tell him it's all off. Oh, won't you stay for lunch? Uh, better not. I have a busy day. 
All right. Will I see you tonight? I'm afraid not, Jen. I, I'm going to be busy then, too. Oh, I see. I'll phone you tomorrow, though, Jen. Yes. Do that. The tree is temporarily safe, isn't it, Russ? And time is on your side again. Soon the tree will be forgotten, deserted. And you can do whatever is necessary to get your gun and letters out. Even chop into it. Jennifer isn't important now. You hurry back to your office. Put in a call to George Carson. He's disappointed when you tell him the deal is off. But then something he says sends a wave of fear sweeping over you. I thought the sale was on, and I wanted to get started right away. You sent Hank Thomas out to chop down the clay tree? Yes, he's probably out there now. Hank! Hank! Oh, uh, howdy, Mr. Thompson. Hank, you can put up that axe. You're, you're all through here. Well, but I just got started. The tree isn't going to be chopped down. But Mr. Carson said... Never mind what Carson said. The deal is off. I, I just talked to him on the phone. The sale is off, huh? That's right. How about that five dollars he paid me? You can keep it. Well, that's fine with me. You know, I was just thinking I should have charged him ten dollars at least. It's a bigger job than I thought. Well, I guess I might as well get on back to the house. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're not going to leave the tree half chopped like this, are you? Why not? Well, there's a storm coming up. You better do something about propping oh, it. Oh, I don't think that'll be necessary, Mr. Thompson. As you can see, I didn't chop very deep into the trunk. There. I don't want to take any chances. Well, whatever you say. I'll get some rope from the house and... The... Let me see. I could loop a rope around that top branch, anchor it with a stake in the ground over there, and then... I could do the same thing on yes, the Yes, yes, yes. I think that'll do fine. Will you get started, Hank? Sure, sure thing, Mr. Thompson. A few minutes later, Hank returns with several long coils of rope attached to two iron hooks, fastens the hooks to the topmost branches, and then climbs down to draw the ropes tight around some heavy stakes. All secure, Hank? Oh, sure, the whole fine, Mr. Thompson. In the morning, I'll see what I can do about something more permanent. Maybe put a jacket of cement around the base of the tree. Just send me the bill when you've finished, Hank. Right. Well, I'll see you later, Mr. Thompson. I got some chores to tend to. Of course, Hank. You go on. You watch Hank start away down the hill. He's brought you just the tools you need, hasn't he, Russ? The ropes and iron hooks he fastened near the top of the tree. The fish your gun and the packet of the Anderson girl's letters from the hollow tree trunk. The first real chance you've had. It'll be easy, won't it? What? It's Jace Devil, Alvira's attorney. You know you must find a way to get rid of him quickly. The wind is increasing in fury and... You're not certain the tree can withstand the pressure of the storm after Hank's chopping into the trunk. And until the evidence against you is removed from the tree, the letters destroyed and the gun disposed of, they'll always be a threat to you. Hello, Jace. Hi, Russ. Still worried about the tree? Well, I thought I thought it best to take certain precautions. Of course. I must say you've shown great concern over the welfare of the clay tree, Russ. Well, yes, but you see, I, I, I felt a certain responsibility, Jace. After all, I, I should have checked with you before okaying Jennifer's sale to Carson. I understand, my boy. I understand. Well... Yes, I'll get back to the house, Russ. Coming along? Uh, no, not right away. The wind's rising. I want to see how those ropes hold. I'll be along. All right. Don't think you have to worry, though. I say the old clay tree is going to stand for a long time. Yes. Yes, it does seem that way. Because so many tires these days claim to have some kind of guarantee. Tonight I'd like to point out the difference in tire guarantees. Point out the extra protection you get in the double guarantee on Lee tires. 
You see, guarantees against defective workmanship and material are quite common. But few tires are backed by a written road hazard guarantee such as is offered by Lee. A guarantee you can read, see what it says, and have it with you when you need it. Most important, however, is what Lee's generous road hazard guarantee covers. It covers any unexpected damage to a Lee Super Deluxe tire during the first 15 months. Any damage, such as cuts or bruises, which might make it necessary to replace a tire. Now, obviously, in order to give you such a generous written guarantee, Lee tires must contain extra quality, although you pay nothing extra for them. Any one of the hundreds of thousands of enthusiastic Lee tire owners could tell you how much extra Lees give. Extra mileage, extra safety, extra value that make it well worth your while to get your next tires at one of the 19,000 Lee tire dealers throughout America, which include all signal service stations. The news of the tragedy spread quickly, and the townspeople flocked hurriedly to the scene. A windswept hill, a twisted, misshapen tree silhouetted against the sky. Exactly how the accident happened was not quite clear to them. But one thing was, the clay tree had claimed another victim. The one man in a position to guess what might have happened, attorney Jace Devlin, told his story to the sheriff. When I left, Russ Thompson was standing right here, Sheriff. He was worried about the tree standing against the storm. I figured he was going to climb up. Tighten things up a bit. Yeah, I guess that's what he did, all right. When Russ failed to show up at the house, I came back and... There he was, up there swinging at the end of the rope by his neck. And from where the rope is hanging over the limb, it looks as though he climbed the tree, unfastened the hook, and was bringing it down to fasten it lower down on the tree. And he must have tried to throw the rope over that other limb there and slip. Yeah, I guess that's how the rope got tangled around his neck as he fell. Yeah, that's the way it must have happened. Too bad. It sure is. Poor Russ. The pity of it is that the very tree he was trying so hard to protect, for Elvira Clay's sake, finally hanged him. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember. Regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. You may even save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Larry Dobkin, Gene Bates, Herb Butterfield, Parley Bear, George Neese, and Britt Wood. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Adrian Jean Doe, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network.